All right. Check, check, check. Microphone, microphone. Talking calmly yet firmly to communicate that we are about to begin. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the gathering. My name is Lance Marshall. I'm one of the pastors here at the First United Methodist Church of Fort Worth. I'm so glad that you're here. The gathering is two services of worship, one here at 930, the other one up in room 350 at 11 o'clock. Uh, I cannot express how thankful I am for seeing you, the faithful remnant, here today. It is both the first Sunday of spring break and it is uh, spring forward time. If you ever needed more evidence that there are forces working against God in the world, it is those two days happening at the same time, but you are here and I cannot thank you enough for it. If you haven't already, please make sure to get a cup of coffee uh, and something to eat from the tables in the rear of the room. We do eat, drink coffee and eat food during the entire service. If at any point you ever need a refill or anything else, please feel free to get up and help yourself. If you also need to uh, stretch your legs or go use the restroom or have a little one who needs to get up, the easiest way to do so is to go out the door on the side and through the garden to the main body of the church and you'll find everything that you need there. Before we get started, we have just a couple words of announcement. First announcement, coming up. We have a group of young professionals here at our church we call the Yo Pros. Those are folks in their 20s and early 30s who get together regularly. Every uh, Sunday after worship, they meet in the rear of the room and then walk over to Bongiorno uh, for a group chat talking about the service and what's going on in each other's lives. Uh, they also have a game night once a month. The next Yo Pro game night is this Tuesday. That is March 13th. Uh, it's going to be at 6.30 and it's going to be at Brood on Magnolia. Brood's a really cool coffee and cocktails place, a uh, chance to get something to eat. Uh, so bring your favorite game. If you want any more information or have questions about that, uh, just write game night on the card that is in your seat when you sit down, and we'll make sure to include you uh, for any extra information you need, no R, you know, RSVP or anything's necessary. If you have a game that you love, bring it. Uh, the group will be hanging out and playing this Tuesday. Uh, next announcement coming up. So uh, we have the regular Christian men's breakfast once a month. That's for guys in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. Uh, we meet at uh, Whiskey Ranch, which is the home of Firestone Robertson Distilling over on the east side of Fort Worth on what uh, used to be the Glen Garden Country Club estate. Incredibly cool. We meet from 7 to 8 o'clock in the morning. It's a free breakfast. Uh, we have really focused discussions on the intersection of faith and family and careers. Uh, it's one of the coolest things that we do here at the church. The best part Part is you getting a chance to meet a bunch of other really great guys who are going through uh, the same stages in life that you're going through, uh, who are wrestling with these same issues. Uh, it's incredibly fun. I really love it. It's Wednesday, March 21st, uh, so two weeks coming up. If you write breakfast on your card, I'll make sure uh, to include you on all the emails and information about that. So if you or someone in your life is a guy in his 20s, 30s, and 40s, it's open to all guys. You know, if you want to come, come on. I just really want to emphasize to guys in those age groups that it's a place for them because they're weird about not showing up to stuff. So you have no excuse. That was going to be a joke. There's no funnier one coming. So you have to decide if you're in or you're out right now. Uh, last announcement coming up, we had a group discussion. We decided to do Easter this year. Uh, we do need more ushers and greeters to sign up for those services to help out. Uh, we have an awesome response from the gathering. Thank you so much. But we do have some more opportunities for people to help greet and reach out. The reason that's so important is that this is the first time or the first time in a long time that a lot of people will be giving Christ a chance in their life. Uh, they'll be coming to a church. They'll be trying on what it means to maybe be a Christian, to make worship a part of their rhythm. And, and you just being here and putting on a friendly face and making them feel comfortable and helping them to a seat and helping them know that they found the right place for them uh, is just incredibly meaningful. So if you never volunteered before or if it's been a while or if you do every, every Sunday, I ask that you please consider signing up to participate in those services uh, Holy Week has a Monday Thursday service at seven o'clock, the Thursday before Easter. Our six fifteen service is a family oriented service. Uh, we really emphasize um, uh, having amazing services for kids on Monday Thursday and Good Friday. Uh, those are two really important parts of the Christian faith that don't get explained to kids very awesome, very well. And we do an excellent job of communicating those very difficult but important topics to kids to the point where those services are often full with families from other churches because uh, their churches don't do the same amount of work in that area. So even if you have neighbors who are faithful parts of other churches, please let them know that we have Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday services for kids and their families at 615. Uh, we'll have stuff for adults at 7 o'clock, uh, as well as on noon on Good Friday. And then Easter Sunday, we're going to have services at 8, 9.30, and 11 o'clock in the sanctuary. We're going to have normal gathering services at 9.30 and 11 o'clock in our normal places. However, one of the things that you need to know is that the gathering has had already twice this month as many people in our 930 worship service as we had on Easter last year. Our community's grown a whole lot, and there's not a whole lot more room in our space. So what we're going to be doing during the Easter 930 service is simulcasting the service live. It's, the 930 gathering is always available live. Hello, Internet. 
Uh, and all of you out there, there, apparently there's a Sunday school class that watches us in Lubbock, Texas. Hello. God bless y'all. Um, they're also Presbyterian and not Methodist, so think about it. Um, so uh, that, that's always an option. We're going to be live streaming that upstairs into room 350. We're going to have all the same hospitality and everything up there. I'm asking you to consider, if you're a gathering lifer, if you're one of these people who's ride or die for the gathering and is going to be here all the time, I ask that you consider worshiping in that space uh, at 9.30 on Easter Sunday. That way, the people who are coming for the first time get an opportunity to experience what it is to worship here, what they can look forward to the rest of the year. And, and if, you know, if there's any issues or anything like that, I just hope that they happen with the people who are already here and already serious about Christ and already committed to the church. Uh, I ask that those people experience the room up in 350 so that everyone here who's new for the first time, they get to hear all the wonderful jokes in person. We know that's going to seal the deal. Uh, so I ask that you make those spots available for those guests that are going to be here for the first time. Any questions about that, feel free to email me or reach out. And then, of course, we're going to be doing big services in the sanctuary all day long. So uh, the next thing, every time we come together, we pass the baskets. Two things go in the baskets. One is your attendance card. There was a card in your seat when you sat down. Whether this was your first time or your 100th time at the gathering, I ask that you make note of your attendance. I also want you to take a look on the back and see there's little check boxes you can check. If you've ever wanted to make more friends at church, I ask that you consider volunteering. If you check that box, we'll reach out to you and find a place for you to get plugged in. If you've ever wanted to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation uh, with me or with a pastor, click that box, and I'll make sure to take you out for a cup of coffee, get to hear some of your story. Uh, if you wanted to know more about the breakfast or more about game night, make sure to put those things on the card. We'll add you to those email lists. Um, please Please make sure to put those in the basket as they come around. The second thing that goes in our baskets are our financial gifts, our tithes and our offerings. Uh, those are our financial gifts to support the work that God is doing in the world through this portion of the body of Christ, uh, our church. And I just I want to thank you so much for your faithful stewardship and your giving to support this mission. If you've never given before, I want to ask you to consider it. One of the things that is a real hallmark of a changed life is people's willingness to put God first in everything that they have and everything that they are, and that includes the resources of time and wealth. And one of the things that's incredible to see is the amount of growth that's happening in the spiritual lives of this community, of the gathering, the growth that is taking place in this community in all the hallmarks of discipleship, of prayer and of service and of giving is incredible to watch. So I just want you to know that you're surrounded by an incredible, faithful community, which includes stewardship. I can't thank you enough for that. Please consider joining my family and supporting this mission of the church as the baskets come around. Now, the first thing that we do every time we gather together is have an invocation led by one of our own. Audrey Bell is going to lead us. Standard church rules apply. She's going to read the leader portion. We are going to read out loud the bold in italics. Now, let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship as Audrey leads us. Did we make it? Weird? Oh, yeah. that's a pro right, right there. We got it, yeah. I, it's natural to me. All right. We gather to share in our love of God. Lord, open our hearts and let us share your great news. We gather to share our witness to God's goodness. Lord, let our lives bear witness through service to your people. We gather to praise God whose love is eternal. Lord, our hearts to to sing our praise. Amen. Good morning. It's good to see y'all. I see y'all didn't sleep in. I almost did. I'm not going to lie. So we're going to do this song. The intro was really long, but I'm pretty sure you've heard this before. And if not, you'll get it. We can start the track. Um, so like I said, the intro is long, but we're going to sing this. Are you guys ready to sing? I know we missed an hour of sleep, so I'm looking forward to making sleep. But we're going to sing this and sing it well. Try! 
dry bones becoming as flesh. And these are the days of your servant David, rebuilding the temple of praise. These are the days of the harvest. The fields are all wide in your world. And we are the You could say the same thing after every sermon. <laughs> that was a lot of work, guys. There was a lot of repetition, but we made it through it. So glad you were with us today. So uh, in addition to raising our voice in praise, in addition to inv invocating the Spirit of the Lord, in addition to experience the sacrament of Holy Communion and the Word proclaimed and Scripture read, uh, we always pray to God together in this service. We do it with what we call prayers of the people. It's a structured time of prayer and response that I'll lead us in. It begins with the prayer of confession. Prayers of confession are never about beating ourselves up or being negative on ourselves. It's just about honestly acknowledging where God is reaching each and every one of us today. At the conclusion, I'll say, Lord, in your mercy, and you'll respond by saying, hear our prayers. Let's try that. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. After that, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll pray to God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and so we'll pray uh, prayers that um, acknowledge God's tri tri triune nature uh, and have that same call and response. And then I'm going to lift up a few names, and then I'll say, are there any others? And when I say, are there any others, it's your chance to lift up names. It's your chance to lift up the names of people who have joys and celebration and thanksgiving to give to the Lord. Uh, it's also a chance for you to lift up the names of people who are going through times of illness, pain, uh, depression, anxiety, disease, fear, grief. Uh, it's a chance for us to lift up their name and lay them on the altar for the God that we know hears and listens to our prayers. In a room this size, we don't try to pray one, of a one at a time. We just speak out loud and let the air fill up uh, with the names of those that we lift before our God. So now, together as a church, will you pray with me? God of mercy and patience, be with us this day. 
Help us to remember that the gifts we give go to help many people in need. Remind us again that our lives are meant to be gifts to others for healing, hope, comfort, and love. Forgive us when we get so caught up in the details of living and when we become so overwhelmed by our current economic woes that we neglect to help others. Enlighten us again with your spirit and your words of healing love. Caring and sharing are the hallmarks of discipleship with Jesus Christ. Heal and forgive us. Give us hearts for joyful caring and sharing. For it is in Jesus' name that we offer these words. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Father God, you are the creator of all things, everything, and everything that you create, you call good. And evidence of that goodness continues to proclaim your greatness all around us. New hope, new loves, new lives, new opportunities, new forgiveness, new children, new families. For this, O oh God, we give you thanks. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. At the same time, O oh God, all, everything that you create, you make to be free. And over and over again, that freedom is exercised for the purposes of sin and death. Isolation, violence, greed, despair. Remind us that when we were at our worst, you did not give up on us or turn away from us, but joined us in the power and presence of your Son, Jesus the Christ, not to forsake us, but to redeem us, remake us, reclaim us in your image now and forever. For this, O oh God, we give you thanks. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Always and everywhere, O oh God, we are never alone. Your Holy Spirit comes alongside us, your advocate, your guide, showering your grace, teaching us your ways. God, help us open our eyes to this. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For Don Tallman, Lord, in your mercy. For Indy Butler, Lord, in your mercy. Are there any others? Lord, in your mercy. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, in your mercy. For all these names spoken out loud and all the names kept in the silence of our hearts, O oh God, hear our prayers. For all those experiencing another day of struggle, of sacrifice, hear our prayers. For all of those who are reaching out to you in the midst of their darkness, grief, and despair, hear our prayers. And for each and every one of us seeking to turn our lives in the image of your Son, Jesus the Christ, hear our prayers. Guide us, keep us, show us your ways, make us into your people. In all that we are and all that we do, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Hear our prayers. Amen. Everyone, thank you so much. I'm so glad that you're here again today. So uh, my name is Lance. This is The Gathering. Uh, this is how we roll. Uh, every, every time we come together, we focus on a series of topics for numbers of weeks in a row. Uh, we'll discuss different things uh, from a couple of different angles, uh, reflect on them, uh, and try to understand uh, what does Scripture have to teach us about this? What does the Christian tradition have to teach us about this? What does the will of God have to shape us and teach us and mold us around these issues or these thoughts or these reflections? Uh, this is a season called Lent. In our church and in most Christian churches, we observe this season as the church has for thousands of years that lead us up to the Easter season, 40 days, not including Sundays, that come immediately before Easter we use as a time of reflection and of repentance and of focusing on our own sinfulness, sometimes our own shortcomings, basically the, we, the ways in which we are all desperately in need of the good news of Jesus Christ. And so over the course of this season, the gathering has been focusing uh, really intently on a very simple concept. That's the concept of fear. So over and over again, uh, the number one uh, commandment in the Bible is do not fear. Do not fear. Do not fear. Over and over and over again, the number one commandment by virtue of repetition, Old Testament, New Testament, is the language of do not fear. And that's because it is fear that is the opposite of faith. Not doubt. It is fear that is the opposite of faith. So over and over again, a positive way to put it, the Bible is saying to us, have faith, have faith. Have faith. And so we've been reflecting on what it is that challenges our faith, what it is that makes us have fear. Uh, so in week one, uh, we talked about a fear uh, that is particularly strong and prevalent in our lives. The younger that we are as adults, teenagers, uh, young adults, many people kind of move past it as they get older. But the number one peer re fear reported by people uh, in their teens, 20s, and 30s is the fear of failure. 
right? The fear of failure. Not going to work. Um, so uh, the, this is particularly the fear of trying something, of putting yourself out there, of opening up your heart in a certain way, of experimenting, of reaching out. The number one fear that gets reported is the fear of failure. And so we try to take a deeper look at that, right, in week one. And look, what is it about failure, right? What's the thing behind the thing? that fills us with so much fear, right? And so we talked about the idea that when people are reporting a fear of failure, what they're really saying is they have a story in their head of how this could go if they end up experiencing failure. And the story that they're telling themselves is that the consequences of trying and falling short is going to be shame and isolation and rejection, right? No matter what kind of failure that is, maybe trying a business and it not working out. Well, if it doesn't work out, my relationships are gonna fall apart. My financial security is gonna fall apart. My life is gonna fall apart by by virtue of trying this and it not succeeding, I'm going to experience shame and fail in rejection and isolation. Uh, when some of our young people are just stressing out over colleges and what they can possibly get into, they have this constant narrative that tells them, if I don't get into the same college as my other friends or the people that I want to follow, I'm going to experience shame and rejection and isolation. That's the real fear that people are articulating when they're saying, I have a fear of failure. That's the thing behind the thing. And so in week one, we looked at uh, Jesus's answer to that and how he treats Peter, the greatest failure who's ever existed in all of humankind, a person who failed worse than you will ever have the opportunity to fail in denying that he knew Jesus in the moment when Jesus needed him the most. And what does Peter experience? Not shame, not isolation or rejection. He experiences the Christ who calls back to them and says, in the midst of your failure, you are loved. In the midst of your failure, you are redeemed. In the midst of your failure, you are still mine. You have nothing to fear of failure because of who Christ is and what Christ does for you. That's the lesson that we learned from Peter, right? So the next week, We talked about another fear. Uh, This is a fear that gets communicated across age groups, and it's the fear of there not being enough, right? We talked about the idea that for most people, this is the fear that there's not going to be enough money, right? But it can also be the fear that there's not going to be enough jobs or there's not going to be enough educational opportunities, the fear that there's not going to be enough viable spouses, Right? Even though over and over again we live in a community that does a better job of giving us opportunities for wealth than any other community, that does a better job of giving us opportunities for employment than any other community, that does a better job of giving us opportunity for meeting spouses than any other community, yet we still communicate this fear. So in the back, that's my buddy Jeff. He's going to fall asleep. He loves me, but I'm not super engaging. Mike, you're in charge of, of shaking shoulders. Welcome to the gathering. <laughs> this is how we roll. Um, so You are all loved and welcome here. Know that. You are all loved and welcome here. This is your place. All means all. So um, one of the things uh, that we communicated is why do we have this fear of not being enough, of there not being enough, right? Of there not being enough for us. And we talked about that happens when you live with idols at the center of your life. Right? When you live with an idol at the center of your life, we learn from studying the Hebrew scriptures, if that idol is Baal or Asherah, what they are going to constantly tell you is you are not sacrificing enough, you are not giving enough, you are not making enough tithes and offerings, you are not giving enough. Right? That is what happens when you live with an idol at the center of your life. Now, very few of you are going to go home and be tempted into making Baal and Asherah the center of your life, but every single one of you is going to be tempted to go home and make money the center of your life. And every single one of you is going to be tempted to go home and make your career success the very center of your life. And each and every one of you is going to be tempted to go home and make a Norman Rockwell oil painting picture of family the very center of your life. And if you live with that at the center of your life, then what you will constantly be hearing is you are not enough right? You're not making enough money. You're not receiving enough career success. You're not doing a good enough job of raising your family because there's always more you can be doing to please those idols if they live at the center of your life. Does that make sense? So if you live with an abiding fear that there's not going to be enough, whether that's money or success or recognition or spouses or anything, I want you to seriously consider there's a possibility that you're living with an idol at the center of your life because what Christ says is that he is enough. He is enough for you, no matter where you're from, no matter what you're doing, no matter how much you've achieved or not achieved. He is enough, and you are enough for him, right? If you live with Christ at the center of your life and not an idol, then the number one message you will hear is that he is enough, and you are enough for him. So last week, we talked about the fear of change, right? And this is a fear that very few of us articulate out loud. Oh, yeah, 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 I'm just terrified of change. I can't handle it. You change one little thing, my life is going to come tumbling down, 
right? If you move my cubicle to another hallway, I will freak, <laughs> right? We don't articulate that, and yet over and over and over again, we see the truth of this, right? And we see uh, when people are experiencing a, peer, a fear of uh, change, um, whether those are little changes, uh, whether those are medium-sized changes, like things that happen at work, or those are huge, change, huge changes, uh, like losing careers or losing family members or losing health, um, what we really fear or we really mourn is the loss of our plan, right? When you're really, what's really eating you up inside, what's really reducing the quality of your life when you experience this change is you're mourning the loss of your plan. I had a plan for how this was going to go, right? I had a plan for where this was headed, and it did not include my child having such difficulties, being bullied at school to the point where they're talking about hurting themselves, right? I had a plan on how life was going to go, and it did not involve my working years being a constant struggle just to find someone to take me. Right? I had a plan for how my relationship was going to go, and it did not involve having to start all over after 25 years. Right? I had a plan. Right? And over and over and over again, when people are experiencing these changes, what's really tearing them up inside is the loss of their plan. And so we, talk, we talked about a Hebrew text, uh, which lifts up the heroes of our stories. And over and over and over again, what they point out is that faith has been lived by countless people before you. And everything that you're experiencing, right, every difficulty that you're encountering, every every stone that is being put in your path has been dealt with by somebody else. Do you understand? Everything that you're going through, someone else has experienced. Someone else has seen. Someone else has had to cross that bridge. And what they are able to give to you is a testimony to God's faithfulness in the midst of what they experienced. Right? So when we're talking about having faith in the midst of change, it's not just saying have faith. It's saying have faith and see God's faithfulness as lived in the lives of other people. Right? Let that be a cure to your fear right? of seeing how other people have experienced that same change in their life and know that God is good in your life too. So this week, we talked about a fear that was particularly strong in our youngest people, and I thought, what better day than the Sunday of spring forward times spring break to talk about a fear that some of our second act members have expressed? Does that make sense? That's my polite language for, I didn't have to worry about getting kids up this morning. <laughs> right? There's a number one fear uh, that gets articulated over and over and over again. And uh, I, don't, I couldn't think of a good snappy title for it. The best, the best title I could, I could think of um, was the fear of what I'm going to call physical wane. <laughs> yeah, it rolls off the tongue, right? Somebody asked this morning, what fear are we talking about today? And I was like, physical wane. And they were like, whatever. <laughs> physical wane. And what I mean, you know, wane means to be, to be reduced, to become less, right? To be diminished. I'm talking about the fear of illness, injury, and aging. The fear of illness, injury, and aging. And when I talk about illness, right? I'm not talking about the flu, all right? I'm talking about something chronic. I'm talking about something debilitating. I'm talking about something that you never imagined being written into your story, right? That is now something that you will live with for the rest of your life. It will impact your life and the lives of everyone who cares about you and walks alongside you. I'm talking about something that changes the way you feel. I'm talking about something that changes what you can do Right? I'm talking about something that changes what you're able to do in the world for other people, let alone yourself. We have a fear of illness. We have a fear of injury. Right? We have a fear of accidents. We have a fear of what could happen. Right? Um, I told my dad, I was 21 years old, and he said, what are you doing this weekend? And I said, getting a motorcycle license. <laughs> are you okay with that? And he says, I don't have a problem with that. But at this point, you've become a bad investment. <laughs> so I would like my deposits back, please. <laughs> right? You can tell that these are the things that we fear because these are the things that we call tragedies. Right? These are the things that we call tragedies that we tell, that we write into our stories that change the shape of who we are as families right? My family changed uh, 20 years before I was born because my grandmother's sister was hit by a car 
while she was unloading groceries in her front yard. Right? And this story has been written into the very fabric of our family, what happened to her. Right? I've never unloaded groceries without having my head on a swivel my entire life. Right? Because these are the stories that we tell. We have a fear of aging. Right? And I don't just mean aging as in getting older. I mean aging as in your body changing. Right? Changing what you're able to experience. Change what you're able to do. Changing how you feel. Changing how you understand yourself to be. Right? I remember when I was um, about 13 years old, one of the things I really wanted my grandmother to understand was how much I loved her. Right? How much I loved her. And so I would give her these long, firm hugs. Right? not realizing that she was 80 years old and about 85 pounds. And all of a sudden, her 13-year-old grandson has decided to just squeeze her. <laughs> and I know for a fact that she wanted nothing more than to be hugged tightly by her grandson. And I now know, in retrospect, that it probably hurt. <laughs> right? I don't know if you all knew this. I was about 6'6", 250 when I was 13. <laughs> a lot changed. Yeah. We have this fear, right? We call it, in our, we call it things like falling apart, right? We have this fear of physically waning, right? Of being reduced, of becoming weaker, of becoming limited. What is the thing behind the thing? that makes us have this fear? What is the thing behind the thing that makes us fear illness and injury and aging? I think it's two things. One, I think it's pain, right? This hurts. Each and every one of these things hurts, right? I had, uh, I crossed a major threshold. Um, I crossed from my 20s into my 30s a couple years ago. And uh, um, someone was talking about how when you get older, it hurts. And I was like, I know what you're talking about. And they were like, what? <laughs> and I was like, well, I was at my parents' house, and I, I kicked a bar stool in their kitchen, and I hurt my toe, and it still hurts. That was three years ago. <laughs> that didn't happen when I was 19. And this person was like, okay, you kind of got it. <laughs> right? But each and every one of these things hurts. There's physical pain, right? And at the same time, we have a remarkable resilience for pain, too. I'm not in any way diminishing the very real pains that people in this room and our families are dealing with because of illness, injury, aging, disability. But at the same time, we'll also endure incredible amounts of pain just for exercise or tattoos or childbirth. I think there's something more than just the pain that we feel, that we fear. And I think it's this. The fear of becoming less. We fear becoming less. We fear becoming less useful. Mm. We fear becoming less worthy. We fear becoming less worthwhile. Right? We fear becoming less. Less. I think the reason that over and over and over again, as these become realities in the lives of our friends and families, as we start to realize that we're mortal, we start to fear illness and injury and aging. Why is that? So, um, without getting too far off the rails, uh, there's a lot of different influences in how we think here in the modern West. Uh, there's a concept called uh, platonic ideals or the theories of forms. For any of you who want to re research this a little bit more heavily, uh, this is a pretty bedrock concept in uh, Western philosophy. Um, I do want to let you know that when I took philosophy in college, I got a very strong B. And by strong B, I mean a B that was in no danger of becoming an A. So I'm not going to overemphasize this, but I can say that over and over again in our life, we live with this idealized hypothetical, and then we constantly, realize, we constantly judge our realities in ways that it doesn't live up to that idealized hypothetical. Does that make sense? And I think when it comes to our bodies, each and every one of us is constantly comparing our current existence to that idealized hypothetical, right? For a lot of us, that was us at 19, right? 
or that was us at 22, right? We keep living up to this idealized hypothetical. And as we get ill or as we become injured or as we age, we constantly view ourselves as becoming less than compared to the ideal hypothetical that we at one point had. I think even more of us have an idealized hypothetical that we've never experienced, right? That was taller than we ever were, that was skinnier than we ever were, that was in better shape than anything we ever really actually achieved, that had way fuller head of hair than anything that we are currently experiencing, right? I think a lot of us are judging our life by an idealized hypothetical we've never even had a chance to achieve. And as we become ill, and as we become injured, and as we age, we constantly view ourselves as becoming less and less and less. I used to be young and healthy and vigorous and strong, and now I am sick, and now I am weak, now I am disabled, now I am injured, now I am aged, and we are constantly viewing ourselves as reducing and reducing and reducing, and that pain and fear of this is what is driving us crazy, and that's what's causing us to live in deep and abiding fear. Does that make sense? So pain is not the thing I think that kills. This is. And this is what I want to address today. So uh, I think I, as a pastor, I think the United Methodist Church in general, I think our church in particular, really well models what it is to be both 100% deeply committed to a faithful life in Christ and yet at the same time uh, be able to live in community with other faiths. Uh, I think that's a really important hallmark of who I am and who we are as a church. Uh, However, at the same time, there is one thing that I do not truck, and that is people, particularly non-religious people, who have the claim of saying, well, all religions are basically the same, right? Or they'll say along some lines of, each religion is just a different way up the same mountain, right? That is not accurate. That is not an accurate representation of our religion or of any other religion. And the most important concept that I need you to know about Christianity today, and particularly the way in which it plays into that story, are two things, incarnation and resurrection, right? Incarnation is our uniquely Christian understanding that God put on flesh and dwelt among us, that God joined the human condition, that God came alongside us as a person and experienced what people experienced, felt what people feel, uh, covered with God's own divine grace, the very experience of being human in a way that no other religion even pays attention to. Our God joined us, came alongside us, walked with us, was one of us for the purposes of us being able to know and experience God and know that God knows and experiences us and what we go through and what we experience. Does that make sense? Incarnation is a key concept in our Christian story, and so is the concept of resurrection. And that brings us to our scripture text today. I need you to understand the resurrected Christ with one particular image in your mind. It's in John 20, verses 24 through 28. If you've got the Red Pew Bible in the back, it's going to be on page 829. There's four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This image comes from the fourth one. We're going to be in John chapter 20, and we have an image here of the resurrected Christ, right? The post-crucifixion Christ, the formerly dead, now living Christ appearing to his disciples. And there's a famous story here and I want you to hear again for the first time. After I'm concluded, I'm gonna say God speaks to us through the reading of scripture and you're gonna say thanks be to God. Hear these words. Thomas, the one called Didymus, one of the 12, wasn't with the disciples when Jesus came. The other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But Thomas replied, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, put my finger in the wounds left by the nails, and put my hand into his side, I won't believe. After eight days, his disciples were again in a house, and Thomas was with them. Even though the doors were locked, Jesus entered and stood among them. Coming inside of a locked door, Jesus joins them. He said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hand into my side. No more disbelief. Believe. Thomas responded to Jesus, something he had never said before. My Lord and my God. God speaks to us through the reading of Scripture. Thanks be to God. There's a lot of different theologians who influenced me, who've really said things that stuck in my mind. Uh, Some of them lived a long time ago. Some of them are very recent. There's a woman named Nancy Eastland. 
who is a theologian. Allie's got a picture of her in the back. Uh, Nancy Eastland uh, was born in the 60s. Uh, she was a professor at Emory, uh, Candler School of Theology, good Methodist school. She was born with a congenital bone defect. She had had uh, over a dozen surgeries by the time she was 12. She lived in constant pain. She died at the age of 44 uh, after experiencing countless surgeries from this congenital condition, uh, scoliosis, and genetic lung cancer. She passed away. She lived her entire life uh, with the use of a wheelchair to get around and in constant pain. And growing up in the Christian community, she was only taught a few things about her disability. One, some people in her Christian community told her, well, this is God punishing you or somebody else. Right? And the more that she came to learn and know of God, she couldn't reconcile that with the understanding that God was good and gracious and the words of Jesus. And the other thing that people would say to her is that, uh, well, this is just an opportunity for you to build character. This is something that God's doing to you, to strengthen you, to give you the opportunity to grow in your character. To which she says, I had more character at six years old to last me a, li- last me a lifetime. Right? If that's what God is doing, then the work has been done ten times too much. Right? And so what she did was she set about writing a theology to better understand the nature of God and the experience of her disability. And the image that she kept coming back to was this image of the resurrected Christ. And she points out, do you realize, that text over and over again, it almost always gets brought up in context of belief, right? Thomas had to see the wounds. Thomas had to touch the wounds in order to believe. And blessed are those of you who did not see and yet believed, right? That's the next text. That's almost always how it's taught. But what she points out is, do you realize the significance that the resurrected Christ, do you realize the significance that Christ enthroned, do you realize the significance that the Christ you and I will all meet face to face at one point, that resurrected Christ still bears the mark of injury and suffering in his body? Do you realize the significance that the resurrected Christ had Thomas place his hand in his side, and when he did that, it probably hurt? Do you realize that? What does that say about Christ? And what does that say about your God? It says that the greatest ideal ideal is not youthful energy. Right? The greatest ideal is not a pristine body that you imagine. The resurrected Christ still bears the marks of physical wane. What that says to you is that as you become older, and as you become injured, and as you become ill, as you become weaker, as you become limited, you are not becoming less. Do you understand? You are not becoming less because you being more has nothing to do with your youth. And you being more has nothing to do with whether or not it hurts when you get out of a chair. You becoming more has nothing to do with how long you can run or how long you can stand. You becoming more has everything to do with your faithfulness to God. And Christ, the wounded Christ, the resurrected Christ shows that at the very greatest, Wounds and weakness and pain mean nothing. What means everything is your faithfulness and commitment to God. When you are becoming old, when you are falling ill, when you are hurting every day, you are not becoming less. You are not becoming worthless. You remain just as worthy and just as vital and just as precious in the sight of God and in the eyes of those that love you as you have ever been. The resurrected Christ bears wounds and in doing so teaches us that greatness in God's eyes has nothing to do with the state of your body and everything to do with the state of of your soul. So embrace the illness and the injury and the aging when it comes, because it will. And know that you continue to follow Christ and become greater and greater and greater in the eyes of your God. Please pray with me. Great and loving God, some of us fear aging and illness and injury. We fear the pain, 
But more than that, we fear the feeling of becoming less, of fading away, of falling farther and farther away from our best times, our greatness, our goodness. Remind us, O oh God, that our best times, our greatness, and our goodness have nothing to do with the condition of our flesh, have nothing to do with our youthful energy, and have everything to do with the strength of our spirit and our willingness to be faithful to God no matter the condition of our bodies. God, let us live with no fear. Let us live embracing whatever changes may come, knowing that you are with us in our incorruptible souls now and always, and in all that we do. Let us follow the image of your resurrected Son, Jesus the Christ, as together we pray the words that he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As I invite our communion stewards to come forward and assist with the serving of today's communion, I do so with a reminder that this is a holy sacrament. It punctuates our, it punctuates our week of living. It punctuates our time of worship. It is always a chance to come to the table, to taste, to touch, to feel, to know the grace of Jesus Christ in our lives. And when we come forward, Christ bids us to come remembering what he has experienced. And on the day he was to give himself up for us, he had dinner with his best friends and his disciples, and he pointed out the bread, and he said, take and eat. This is my body not at its youngest, not at its healthiest, not at its strongest. This is my body broken. This is my body broken and suffering and hurting, and it is all for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after the meal was over, he took a cup of ordinary table wine, gave thanks over it, blessed it and passed it, and said, take all of you and drink. This is my blood spilled from my body in pain for you. For the new covenant, for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And when we remember Christ, we remember Christ and his image of him hurting day to day and knowing that therein lies an opportunity for us to taste, touch, feel, and know the promises of God. This is not the First United Methodist Church's table. This is not the gatherings table. This is Christ's table. And like Christ's love, like Christ's grace, like Christ's offering of life eternal, it is open to all people, all ages, all backgrounds, all understandings. We always receive communion by coming forward down the center aisle with our hands held open like this. A piece of bread is torn off the loaf, uh, placed in our hands. We then dip it uh, into the cup, eat it, and return down the outside aisle for a time of silent prayer or for singing along with Shalia. Uh, we always celebrate communion with non-alcoholic grape juice because we don't anyone to ever choose between sobriety and the sacrament. We're also going to have a gluten-free station on the end with karma for anyone with a wheat sensitivity. The table is set. The meal is ready. Come forward and be fed.
can only imagine I can only imagine I can only imagine Just be honest, how many of you details people were freaking out that I gave the smaller pieces of bread to the side that gets more people? Yeah, I, I know you. I know you and my heart grieves for you. We're going to be okay, okay? Christ shows up. We're going to be okay. Uh, as we come to the end of our time of worship today, if you could please help by picking up any pieces of paper, pens, uh, Bibles, taking them all to the rear of the room. That helps us turn this room around uh, for the next service. Yo, pros, do not forget that we have game night on uh, Tuesday at 630 uh, men in their 20s, 30s, and 40s, our men's breakfast is not this upcoming Wednesday, but the following one. Everyone, please be looking at the Easter schedule and figure out how you're going to be able to join us for Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter services. Now, please bow your head and receive this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May God's face raise to shine upon you. And may you, the people of God, focus on the strengthening of your spirit, the youth and energy of your soul, and the vitality of your connection to God now and every day of your life. Amen. Go in peace.